Hello and welcome to another Art of Composing Composer Symposium. This one's a little bit informal, kind of like the last one, because my computer, uh, if you can see behind me, I'm not sure if you can right now, it is still in the shop. Um, I've been waiting on some parts to arrive all week, and, and the part that I need to solder on arrived yesterday, and so today is about me practicing. Uh, so that I don't completely mess up my computer. <laughs> so hopefully it all goes well. It's this little, uh, grab it. little tiny piece called an LVDS, and it allows you to, it connects the screen to the motherboard. And unfortunately, I broke mine when I was pulling the screen off to replace one of the uh, hard drives. So, so yeah, that's the position I'm in. But. I try to look at this as an opportunity and not something bad because I've been wanting to practice soldering and uh, this is the perfect excuse. So, so yeah, that's where I'm at. And I just want to say hello to everybody, hello Robert and, and Henry. So um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I've been for a long time, I've been wanting to build a synthesizer. So this is, this is a great opportunity for me to have an excuse to dive in and, and really work on the soldering skills, understanding the electronics and how it all works. And, and even in just a few days, it, I feel like I've picked up a lot. My son and I, we built a little crab robot thing that kind of scoots along. And right now we're working on a voice changer, just kind of a little practice project before I, you know, hopefully don't destroy my computer. <laughs> but yeah, so um, so go ahead, yeah, post your, your composition questions. I'll tell you what I've been up to recently. Um, I've been trying to really push myself to do a lot more composing for the symphony, just getting my themes down, really starting to get small sections, you know, tied together and structured out a little bit more so that I, I know where I'm going with it. And, and, and what I'm learning is with, with these long pieces, um, I approach it a little bit different than I would a film score because the film score, you've got the crutch of the picture to go off of. So it kind of tells you a little bit when pacing changes and how long you can stay with one thematic idea or one textural idea or anything like that. Whereas, you know, with the symphony or any, you know, classical style work, it's it's up to you. It's completely up to you how long you want to, you know, move with it. So um, I think part of the process is just making forward progress. So doing the best you can, even if you know you're not 100% happy with it, and even if you know you're not, uh, it's not going to be the final product, just, you know, if you've got two themes, figuring out a way to connect the two themes. And then once you've done that, you can look back at it with a little bit of perspective and say, oh, this needs to be a little bit longer. This is, you know, this is too long. This is too short, whatever it is. And, and, and you can make more educated decisions about how you connect things. Um, so, so yeah, that's what I've been. Mm, that's what I've been up to personally with my own composing um, on the art of composing front and kind of uh, analysis and, and where to go with the site. Um, I have been trying to reconcile this idea of partimenti in this traditional way of learning composition, where you basically have these models that traditionally use thorough bass, a bass line, maybe a little bit about uh, melodic ideas. Um, I, I want to bring that idea a little bit more into the future with other styles, not just, you know, Baroque or Gallant style music. So I've been going through and analyzing Chopin's Nocturne. This is Opus 9, number 2. Most people know it. <laughs> So it's that one. And my whole goal is to create a very simplified model that gives you a lot of flexibility with the music. So um, uh, what I'm finding is it's, it is really, it's an interesting process and it's one that I think opens up a lot of possibilities for composers because there's a missing link between your initial phases of noodling and experimenting you know when you're just getting into composition and you're you know you're just coming up with just the fundamental basic ideas and then maybe you learn some theory but there's a big gap between that phase and being able to create long pieces that will be really you know that have a lot of logic to them that uh, have 
a structure that is relatable and human, but still, you know, advanced and developed. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've been trying to, to work that out. And I'll show you kind of my, this is the hand sketch. I'm going to type this out. But the, the goal with the model, and I don't, I don't know if you can see, is, is to pull out what's actually fundamental about each element or each section or theme or anything like that. And I know it's, it's kind of hard to see on the camera. So, uh, and Brooks, um, I see your, your question there. Yes, I will be sharing. These will be on, the, what I'm planning on doing is walking through people on the email list. So I want to take you from, you know, basically not really having done much to going through an entire model to show you how powerful these things are. And as an example, so in, in the beginning, Chopin does this, you know. And that, that you could consider um, a basic idea. Right? Even though it's one measure in the music, real measures, as William Kaplan would call it, are it's two measures, right? It's kind of split into two things. And then here would be two. So you can consider that one single basic idea. Now, if you actually analyze the theme, it looks like we've got a basic idea. Um, and we have another basic idea, so it would be a compound basic idea. So two basic ideas, there's no real cadence in those. I mean, there you could kind of make a case that there's a cadence because there's this 5-1, but it's, it's really a 5 of 2. So here, neither here nor there. I mean, these kind of techni technicalities with an analysis, as long as you understand what's going on. But when I, when I sat down and really started thinking about what's the critical thing here is that You've got this three, two, one in the melody, so. Right? Now he has a little bit of um, melodic embellishment on there, but what you have is. And then you have tonic prolongation, or kind of the way I'm thinking of it is, is kind of you're like a rotation, right? A harmonic rotation, if you're thinking about the harm, harmony chart that we use in Music Composition 101 or 201, you go from tonic back to tonic. Now he's got it as one chord, and it's, the, it's a half diminished two chord. Oh, sorry, I was playing on. And... Um, that's kind of a very common love theme type of sound, right? You hear John Williams doing this a lot where it's... It's got that kind of longing sound to it, that, that half diminished sound, right? Um, but what I realize is that's not the critical element. The critical element is that he's got, he, he kind of jumps back and forth from one harmony to another back to back to the home key, right? From one to something back to one. So I was like, well, I wonder if I could start swapping it out. I, I see everybody saying hello there. So you go like this. Maybe I said, um, maybe a two chord, right? Kind of works. Oh, another thing, it's a pedal. So that was the other critical element. He keeps that E flat. So I was like, okay, well, how far can I take this? So, well, I did that, right? Oh, I could go one, four, one. Right? And it still kind of means the same thing. Right? And I said, well, maybe I could do something a little bit more modern, and I'll do a um, some kind of polychord. So I did an A major chord. Oh, that's a really cool sound. And in fact, that's that's kind of, uh, you know, I could hear John Williams doing something like that, especially on a repetition of the theme, which is something I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, so it, what's the power of the model is the ambiguity of the model, whereas if you're just trying to, you know, model this uh, without figuring out how ambiguous you can get or how precise you have to get on each element, um, then uh, then you're you're kind of stuck with that whereas this 
you're, you're not as stuck. And Greg, I see your question. You're saying, isn't Partimenti more about common use patterns, sort of cliches of the era? And what about Epic Partimenti, for example? Yeah, so it is about uh, what Robert Yerdingen would call mental schemas, right? These, these things that we've got. That's one version of the Romanesca, this uh, canon in D sound. Um, but what I realized is somebody chose it and said this is going to be common language, right? It's, it's not necessarily uh, given to us from on high, from, you know, nowhere. It was a composer at some point who was teaching somebody said, this is an excellent model. I'm going to give this to my students to learn. And what they would learn generally first, they would learn something called the rule of the octave. <laughs> you have a way of harmonizing each of the different bass notes up and down a scale. Um, after that, you would learn cadences, kind of very standard stuff. But then you would learn these uh, patterns, right? But you didn't just learn the patterns. And I think this is where the strength of the partimenti is. Partimenti are longer. They're not just single patterns, right? If I give you a chord progression, I say one, five, six, four, six, five, six, four right, or one, six, four, however you want to look at it. That's all great, but where do I use it? How do I use it? When is it used? How long do I use it for? That's the missing link with a lot of this stuff. Whereas if you're modeling a real piece, right, an exemplar, um, and I, I highly recommend listening to my interview with Robert Yerdingen from, uh, in the Art of Composing podcast. You can find it on my website. Because we talk about this, and having it, in context, I think, is the critical ingredient. Um, and what I'll, I'll, I'll play for you now a little bit more of this, and I'll take you through the, the, the first thematic idea, right? So everybody, I hope, is, has heard that nocturne. It's nocturne, opus nine, number two. Um, if you don't know it, listen to it a bunch of times. You kind of get used to it, find it out on YouTube or something like that. But if, if I go through my, my model here, right, you've got... So you've got three, two, in the melody, one, right? Now he connects it with a descending bass, but that's not all that critical. In the next measure, he goes to a five of two chord, right? Um, and the melody is actually a, a three, but it then jumps up to six, and then to a two chord. And he does a little um, suspension there. Then it goes to a five. And now here's a great example of a common language. This is a very common progression. You've got five going to five of six, going to six, going to some kind of applied dominant to that five again which is a, he's got a seven, right? And then you go back to five. And then he does a little, you know, suspension, leading back to a little cadence, back to one. So essentially that's the thing. What I realize is though, there's, there's potential here to say, I'm not gonna necessarily use exactly the chords he's using. Um, I'm going to figure out where can I modulate in a in a relatively standard kind of way that doesn't mess with the flow of it. So at this five of two, right, where we had the in the in the compound basic idea, right, the second basic idea there. And then to five. I could just as easily change that to some other key. So here we've got C minor or sorry, C major, C major 7, I think, going to, or sorry, C7 going to F minor, right? And then to a B flat, right? Pretty simple, the 5, 1, and then you go up a fourth. So it's like you're going around the circle of fifths. So you could change that. You could do G, C, F. And instead of going to a B flat in the, the continuation, we move to an F major, and now you've modulated a little bit. And then we can end up in B flat as the new key that we modulated to. So I'll show you this. We go 
Um, and I'll even add in my cool poly chord here. So now we're at... theme on B flat, but anybody could listen to that and say, that sounded right. It sounded perfect. It sounded like everything flowed naturally and it, you know, whatever you did, you meant it, right? And that's the power of these models is it gives you context. Now you're not guessing, how do I accomplish this modulation? You're saying, well, where's a logical place within this pattern to modulate? And it's clearly this. When you do that, you just change that five it's, it's a five of something to something else, right? You just change what that five of is. You just pick a new, and it could be anything. I mean, that's kind of the power of dominant chords is sometimes you feel like you can just go to any dominant chord and it, it feels kind of right. So if I go, let's see. modulated from E flat to C major. Um, and as usual, you can always throw in additional chords to make that modulation. When I went from E flat to A7, right, it's a kind of a dramatic shift because that's um, a, a chromatic mediant relationship, right? It's got that kind of, that kind of modern E sound or that romantic sound, I would say. Or maybe a spacey sound, I don't know. You could always try to figure out ways to smooth that over, you know. Maybe making it a um, French sixth. Something like that. So I just think there's, there's a lot of potential here. And um, I finished analyzing the whole piece. And effectively, with this, and I think this is also really cool about these models, is that when you really dive into it, and I think you'll find a lot, a lot with um, Chopin and Schubert kind of the same way, a lot of these romantic composers, there's not really that much original new material within it. You write an eight measure theme, or actually a four measure theme, right? But it feels like eight measures. It depends on how you break it down. Um, and then you have another four measure theme here that is the um, the... Or no, maybe it's three measures. It's this part. Let me, let me play it so you're familiar. Right? I think um, that right there, this is exactly why... Uh, Partimenti are so powerful is that kind of progression, right? That's used all the time in film scoring, and there's different versions of it. There's that version, there, um, there's kind of this sweeter, sadder version where you move to the minor third instead of down. Right, you probably heard that. I think that was used a lot in. Um, in what was the the Disney movie with Angelina Jolie? The I think it was like a Sleeping Beauty one or something. But it's all over the place. Nonetheless, you, you hear that progression all over the place. So being able to put that in context, uh, context, where does Chopin use that? He uses that on the contrasting theme, right? This contrasting middle theme. He goes exposition, right? He repeats the exposition. It's not a repeat sign because he has a lot of melodic ornamentation and development, um, but the underlying theme is exactly the same. Maleficent, thank you, Brooks. Uh, that, was the, um, that was the movie it was in. And yeah, if you listen to the Maleficent score, that progression is used all over the place. Right. And it's a really...
really cool sounding progression, but now you've got context for it. You say, oh, well, maybe I want to have an, a main theme that's a little bit more uh, grounded in tonic, right? Chopin doesn't go straight to that very, um, it's a modulatory sounding theme, right? You're... kind of fourthy sounding too because it's it's almost like you have a plagal cadence at the end here and he actually goes to the minor too what's cool though is that I put it this as it is modulated this theme is modulated this is actually in five it's in B flat um, and even though you have this minor four back to to one E flat in the key, it feels like the whole thing is actually in B flat. You get to a little cadence here in B flat, and then right at the end of that, he's got uh, a sort of omnibus progression. This. And he has this really cool modulation from five back to one in a half a measure. So if in real measure, it's about one measure. He, he modulates back from five to one. If you've never heard of an omnibus progression, all it is is you've got two, the soprano and the tenor, or sorry, the uh, soprano and bass are moving by half step away from each other. And then he kind of modifies it a little bit at the end. Um, so here, I mean, basically we've got a theme type that we're learning. We've got cool harmonies that we're learning, cool progressions, right? How he uses deceptive cadences. How does he write his melodies? How does he actually go about using melodic um, ornamentation? And, and the goal is not just to write a new nocturne based off of his, right? You could, you could always do that. But the goal is to change it up and see the real power of these things, right? kind of improvising off of it, which is one of the things that people used to do as well with Partimenti, another skill, not so much that I'm good at, um, you know, on the spot improvising off of it, but, but using it as a compositional tool and really as a way to internalize the language of great composers. So I'm going through this one. Um, I'm going through this. It's one of uh, the Beethoven uh, bagatelles. I can't remember the opus, but... Um, Not as good at, at playing that one. <laughs> so nonetheless, that's that's what I've been up to, really uh, breaking those down um, and still making slow but sure progress on the orchestration course, kind of understanding how I want to develop it, the ideas and things like that. So uh, that's still coming along. But now that I've said my piece, um, what questions do you guys have on composition? Now's a good time to to ask them. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you've got ideas about pieces that you think would be really good exemplars as amazing pieces, whether they're more modern than that, you know, they could be 20th century, they could be 21st century, romantic, whatever. I think, um, as a community, composers need to start looking at this and saying, how do we, how do we use the tools that they had hundreds of years ago? that led to the greatest composers of all time where we still listen to their music three and four hundred years later, you know? I think there's, um, we've been kind of uh, shorted a little bit on the way composition has been taught for the last hundred years, and I think a lot of it came from Germanic theory, the way they conceptualized and, um, and went about teaching harmony and melody and and getting away from just straight up modeling and copying uh, great composers and learning how to emulate and internalize their styles and their techniques but still make it original enough to call it your own. I think that's the goal is original enough, not not necessarily 
original, breaking the mold, iconoclastic, you know, there's room for that. But I would say when you're in a learning phase of life, which all of us are, you know, um, it's hard to say that you're a master, you know, I, I think other people can look and judge when that occurs, but until somebody says that's what you are, I would just assume that you're not, and, um, and sitting back and saying, my originality is going to come in small doses within these, you know, kind of larger frameworks that I can use to really master this style. So that's where I get excited about adding things like right? adding cool neighbor chords like that. That allows you to really experiment with these sounds and figure out what's working, what's not working. So, okay, Brooks asks, I have to compose two pieces for an audition into a private college. They have to be 15 minutes each or together make up 15 minutes. I uh, have to look again. Is there any form that you would recommend? Well, um, you know, obviously there are some established forms that you could uh, use, you know, sonata form being kind of the big example. Um, what I would do, though, I, I guess I'm not sure what exactly your goal is uh, at this point, and maybe you want to type it in here, you know, what your goal is as a composer, what you want to get out of the school, what kind of program the school has, what's the focus, is it, is it, uh, you know, what style of music, is it uh, popular music, jazz, is it, uh, you know, very avant-garde, classical, is it somewhat avant-garde, or is it, you know, kind of conservative, it, it's hard to say exactly how you would approach it. Um, you know, not to say that you want to be too strategic, you know, trying to play the system like, oh, this, this composer works there, and this is the style of music he writes, so I'm going to just model his stuff. I mean, I would personally, if I knew I had to fill up 15 minutes of music, um, I would probably find some pieces that I like that are that length. And I would do some analysis on them, you know, and not necessarily saying you're going to copy, you know, the types of harmonies or the types of melodies going on or the orchestration style or however it is. But think about the large scale formal elements going on, you know. OK, so the focus on classical music may be on Mendelssohn, Bach, you're saying. Um, yeah, so, you know, a great example of something. I think a great piece that's got a lot of energy, a lot of youthful energy, is the octet by Mendelssohn, right? And I'm not sure exactly the, the, the length. I think it's like, uh, hold on, octet, Mendelssohn. Let me just look it up real quick. The first movement is 13 minutes long. So that's, that's a perfect example, yes. Um, so you've got roughly 13 minutes, right? You may have to do a little bit more or split it up into two pieces. Um, however, he's got big themes in there, right? A lot of uh, varying kind of uh, techniques used and, and um, textures and things like that. Uh, but you can, you can just break it down. And I, I don't want to scare people away from analysis. Analysis doesn't have to be... Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be by the book. You know, I, I'm a huge fan of William Kaplan's work, um, and I feel like it, it's enlightening when you, when you read through and you understand or you go through my Sonata Form course. We talk a lot about those ideas. Um, but that shouldn't hold you back from doing your own analysis and just picking out things that feel important to you. Um, I think there needs to be originality in analysis, just like there needs to be originality in composition. Uh, so if you come through and you pick, you know, just like with this piece, I'm trying to figure out not just what is going on, but how can I change it? Where are the things that are changeable? You know, what's the critical core information? And um, he's got, you know, uh, I, don't, I won't be able to play this, but... Right, he's got this long idea. Right, go through and look at. Okay, this is his basic idea. How many measures is it? How many notes are going? Like, what is? How long and and grand does this basic idea have to feel? It it feels pretty big when you listen to it. Right, it's got this kind of 
it keeps going up and up and up. Da, 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 right? So now you could look at that. You could say that's a basic idea, or you could say that's a, a basic idea or a compound basic idea. Um, however you want to sit down and analyze, uh, analyze it, or call it whatever you want. Call it your, your two-bar rigmarole. I don't know what you want to call it. As long as you've got some mental construct of what it is, why it works, and how you're going to modify it for your own uses, right? The other big things I would I would look at is where do big chunks begin and end, right? So an easy way to find those, one is just to listen and to kind of close your eyes and say this feels very different from the last part, right? So and if you find that spot in the score, you, you do a big red line or something feels very different there. And you may be off by a measure or something like that, but something's big. Usually there's an orchestration change. Usually there's some kind of harmonic change, dynamics change, articulations changing, right? These secondary parameters is kind of what we would call them. They're big signals to you that there is a big change uh, compositionally going on. Go through, find all those big changes, find where things repeat, find material that's that's taken out of here and fragmented, chunked up. You can say, oh, here he's got a development section and he's taken this idea and he's done it for three measures, and then at the end of that third measure, he modulates to a different key, repeats it again, right? It doesn't, it doesn't take a whole lot of, of um, experience uh, analyzing to begin analysis, right? You, you need to be able to look at the, the notes and say, I can figure out what this harmony is. This is an E flat major, right? Or, or it's a C minor seven, or whatever it is. Um, so I would recommend just doing that. And one of my favorite things to do is print it out and get colored pencils and make it look, you know, colorful because you start to see the structure. Now, one of the things I do with the models when I do this is that I, when it's a new element, I write it out on a new uh, system. And the benefit of that is, is it chunks it up for you in terms of what do you have to compose. I know that to model Chopin's piece, I've got to write this first theme. And... In this first theme, maybe the first time around, I just do it in one key. Second time around, I know this uh, second basic idea right here, the, the uh, compound basic idea, um, is a great point for me to modulate. So maybe on the repetition, even though Chopin doesn't do it, I'm going to modulate and take this through to a new key. That means my contrasting middle section right here is going to be in a different key. And then I can choose here, do I want to, uh, you know, retransition back to E flat, the original key, or do I want to try modulating to an even further remote key? You know, there, there's a lot of choice still. Um, and I think that would be a good way for you to get your head wrapped around a larger piece. Now, this is something I think a lot of people don't realize when they're writing something is that you can write a whole thing and then you can go back and change the beginning. You may write a theme and you, you like the theme at the time, you feel it works, and then you move on and then you you write a contrasting middle and maybe you write something newer here and you say, you know what, the first one didn't really work all that well. Um, I'm going to go back and change it. So, oh, and Colin actually, <laughs> that is that is very good advice. Colin wrote, uh, as good as John's advice is, why don't you ask somebody at the college about what they're looking for? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, make sure you're interfacing and talking to your professors uh, who are going to be at the college, potential teachers, and, and just say, what is it that What's expected of me? You know, what level of composition are you looking for? Obviously, you're enrolling to learn, so you know. So I don't imagine they're expecting that you already have all the skills that they're going to be teaching. I think they want to see, you know, what it is that you're capable of at this moment right now. So, so yes, absolutely. But 15 minutes is is a lot of music. There's there's no doubt about it. But I don't think they're looking for, well, hopefully they're not looking for, you know, minimalism <laughs> where you're just. <laughs> All right, copy and pasting. Don't copy and paste too much. <laughs> so good question, though. I, I like it. And, you know, I like I said, my own personal study, I'm moving a lot into these models and how to emulate these languages and modify these languages. So that that's that's the direction I'm going to point you in, and, and I don't think it's going to steer you wrong, um, but yeah, finding composers you want to emulate in your own language, uh, I think is, is just a winner, so. Okay, um, 
go ahead and post some more questions if you got them. I'm sorry I don't have the full setup where I can show you all the notation and everything. I haven't, haven't set everything up like I do on my big computer. Uh, and I'm just hoping everything goes well uh, soldering today. It may not be today. I may, I'm, I'm practicing. I got some old broken computers from the family business that were all, you know, like 10 years old. And I was like, let me just start to clean those up and, and uh, try to take things on and off. So let's see. Bob Lyon, um, uh, he's asking, have you heard of Tosin Abasi? I have not, so I apologize. I am not familiar. Um, let's see. Eric is asking, any advice for a high schooler dreaming of being a composition major? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, I would say you've got an opportunity when you're in high school. You've got a lot of time. And I know sometimes it doesn't feel like that, but I guarantee anybody who's out of high school, whether they're in college, they're in the workforce, their parents or grandparents, they're just going to tell you your time keeps getting more and more valuable the older you get just because you have more responsibilities, right? So you have a lot of time, and I would say don't squander it um, and, and use this as an opportunity to just compose as much as you can right, really start to just get comfortable with writing pieces of music, uh, you know, obviously learning as much theory and, and analysis and, you know, just trying to absorb as much as you can right now is good. But the, the other side of the coin for me um, is, is how are you picking your school that you want to go to? And this is something I really, I learned the hard way. Now, I, I, my school wasn't a bad school. It's a very good school. It's Furman University out in South Carolina. Um, and the music department's a good music department, but really what I learned at the time is it wasn't really a compositionally or theory-focused theory department. Now, it may have changed since then, I'm not sure, um, but the when I showed up my freshman year, I got my, my, my advisor, my freshman advisor was the organ teacher, right? They stuck me with the organ teacher. I was a trumpet player, but I really wanted to know theory and analysis. Um, so that was something I should have raised a red flag, say, hey, I, I want to be with somebody who teaches theory and this is and, and composes. This is what I want to do, and, and that's really where my focus should be. Um, so that was strike number one. Strike number two, the main composition teacher went on sabbatical my freshman year. I had no idea that was going to happen. Um, so that frustrated me too because I came in, I expected that, okay, I'm going to be pushed along in the direction I want to go by people who do what what it is that I want to do. And that didn't happen my freshman year. Um, on top of that, I tested out of my first semester of theory. So then I was enrolled in other classes that really I didn't much care about because, and it was all because I, I knew a little bit about voice leading. That was, that was it. I, I, didn't, I had never done Roman numeral analysis in my life. Um, I knew what chords were uh, from playing jazz, and I knew the concept of voice leading because when you play jazz, you end up learning about voice leading, you know. Just naturally, you, you, when you're learning how to comp and, right, your fingers have to move in small amounts, and that's what leads to, you know, good voice leading with your, with your comping and your chords. So I knew that stuff, and I tested out, <laughs> and... Looking back, I was like, well, that was really frustrating for me because there was things that I didn't learn. I, they were teaching the basics of Roman numeral analysis, and they were teaching just the absolute basics of voice leading, which nobody really taught me properly. Um, and then on top of it, my, my trumpet teacher at the time, uh, I, I think, really wanted to push me more towards playing as opposed to the theory side of things. And that's not what I wanted to do, and I didn't really stand up and say that's not what I wanted to do from the beginning. I just kind of like, okay, I'll follow along. It all led to me ending up switching from music as a major uh, the, a year and a half later, right? There was just issues that developed over time in the music department where I just felt like I wasn't gelling there and I wasn't getting what I wanted out of it. And I was also going through ROTC and they were conflicting and I was like, you know, it's not worth this. And and I don't want people to ha have that happen to them you know, without uh, without the right intervention. So, 
So I would say be very careful about the school that you pick. Make sure that it, it's going to be the school to nurture you in the right direction with the right people. You know, don't just, don't just pick a school because the school's got a good name. Pick a school that has great composition teachers that, ha that write the kind of music that you would like to write and some that don't write the kind of music that you'd like to write but you know is going to push you uh, and push your ears. You know, if somebody's writing very avant-garde music that is, you're not comfortable with, that actually may be something really good for you to open up your mind and say, I can expand into different directions to try composing in different styles. Um, but also there needs to be something that resonates with you there. Uh, I would say also, you know, finding a place that has a creative community uh, is not going to be too detrimental to that. You know, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you've got to move to L.A. or New York or anything like that. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, cities around the U.S. and Europe and things like that that have really strong creative communities. And um, picking one and, you know, really understanding what it is you're going to get out of it. I, I think... Looking at those elements, you'll feel a lot more comfortable with the schools that you're applying to. So, so yeah. And, and don't forget, it's a place to learn. It's a place to grow. So you don't have to have everything mastered. Um, I would, if you don't play piano right now, um, you know, it looks like maybe you're a trumpet player by your, by your uh, avatar there. Um, but if you don't play piano, I would learn how to play piano a little bit. You don't have to be a master of piano or anything, but, you know... <laughs> learning to play a little bit of the Bach two-part inventions and a couple little ditties here and there. Um, and probably more important, you know, learn how to play block chords, right? In all inversions so that you can quickly work out harmonies. Um, and as you get a little bit further on, you know, learning more advanced harmonies. Right, this kind of stuff. Learning that kind of stuff, a great way to learn that is through thorough bass, right? Traditional thorough bass, because you, you learn how to do bass lines in the left hand and understand how to harmonize that with very, very little information. I mean, if I see if I see a B flat and it's in the key of B flat and there's nothing else there, I know it's going to be just a triad. But if you see a six, right, you know that that's a first inversion G minor chord right there. So that kind of stuff also really helps, and that opens up a lot of those partimenti we were talking about earlier. Hopefully that, that is um, enough information for you. Let, let me move on to a different one. Let's see. Uh, Bob asks, I started composing music in high school and was in competition with two other great composers. We reached a, plate a plateau, and now in uni I find it hard to compose music with substance. Um, you know... I think probably the problem is that you're trying to compose music with substance. That right there, that's the hang-up, the substance part. Anytime that I'm in a kind of a funk, anytime that I'm in a, a place where I'm like, man, this music just sounds, you know, pathetic and weak and plain. It's just another one of the things that I've done in the past 100 times. A lot of times you just have to make your way through that. Right? You just have to compose through that period. It's like, it's like your, your mind is clouded with all the stuff that you know too well. And part of it is you just need to work through it and, and get that out of your mind. And that's why I say, you know, making progress, writing actual bars of music and getting to the end of a piece is critical because then you get to know your piece and that's where you can go back and modify and often the pieces that I've liked the most, it's not so much that they started off as great pieces that I, I felt I was writing. It's that I found the places where they needed to be changed to make them significantly better. Now, whatever your, your musical goal is um, can obviously influence how you're writing the music. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're writing a classical piece and you want it to sound like a traditional Mozart and it's for, you know, just fun, you know, whatever you're doing, kind of right, kind of classical sounding stuff, then that's going to lead to a certain style of piece. If you're doing something where it's like you want it to be relaxing minimalism,
right? That's going to lead to something else. So, so thinking about what is your musical goal more than just saying substance. Substance is the same thing as saying I want it to be great or I want it to be important. It sounds like a great word, but in reality, it's fuzzy. It's Your brain doesn't have anything to grab onto. So you need to be clearer with what the musical goal is of that. And, and you should only try to reach that goal. You shouldn't try to say, I'm going to make a masterpiece, right? If my goal is to write something that sounds classical, I'm not trying to write another Mozart Requiem, or I'm not trying to write another, you know, Beethoven Symphony Number no. 5. I'm just trying to write a classical piece. And if I accomplish that goal, then I will have accomplished the goal that I set out to do. If it turns out to be really good, then that's that's a good thing. That's great. If it turns out to be okay, that's a good thing too. I mean, the goal was to write a piece that does this, right? Write a piece that allows people to relax and chat, right? If that's your goal, then you can do that. You just... not too busy then that could have accomplished that goal right there so I would say um, just be clear with what the actual goal of the piece that you're writing is and when you're feeling in a funk you feel like you don't have any ideas your writer's block right through that and one of the best tricks I know is to sit down and say I'm gonna write the worst piece of music that I've ever written and you just make it as chunky and plain as you possibly can and more often than not you get to a certain point you're like eh, this actually isn't that bad. I, this is something here. There's something to grab onto you. Right there, I started adding little doodads and changing it up. And it, actually, I kind of liked it. So maybe I'll go back and I'll write that. I'll write through that thing. So, so yeah. Okay, let's see. Chris... Oh, no, no. Brooks is asking, are there any add-ons for Sibelius you would recommend? Actually, yeah, there are quite a few of them, um, and they're mostly on the big computer behind me, so I, I can't remember everything off the top of my head. Mm. But, and actually, I was going to say, <laughs> one of them, I believe, is fixed in the latest version of Sibelius. It's, it's the magnetic uh, arpeggio lines for... Um, for the harp, but there's one called line between notes, right, which allows you to do lines that connect from note head to note head easily. There's um, one called, I think it's called multiply dynamics, which is absolutely amazing, phenomenal, and it's so simple, but all it is is you write the dynamics out for one line and then you select the other lines and then, then you click multiply dynamics and it'll copy the dynamics exactly to all those other parts. Um, and what I like to do, if it's something that I use a lot, like the multiply dynamics, I actually made it a shortcut. So I do, you know, command option, control, shift, which you can easily do with all four of your fingers here, and then a C, and it goes, bloop, and I'm able to copy all my dynamics over. There's another one which um, is, uh, I think it's called increase dynamics or increase and decrease dynamics, and you can... You can take all like piano and change them all quickly to mezzo piano just by selecting them and, and using the thing. And once again, I, I create a shortcut for it where it's the same, all four plus an up arrow, down arrow. So those are two that I use a lot. Um, uh, there are some heart pedaling ones that I use a lot I would look up. But really, I think you'll find that there are a ton of plugins out there, and anytime I'm doing something and it's a little bit slow or frustrating, I just Google it. I say, you know, is there a Sibelius plugin for changing dynamics quickly? And there's three or four of them out there that, that allow you to kind of do that, that, that kind of process. So I would recommend go on, um, I can't remember what it's, I think it's called Music Notes, or it's the former Sibelius blog. Uh, they had a list of all the plugins laid out you could quickly s scan through. And then if you Google it, usually the Sibelius forums will pop up where somebody said, oh, you know, somebody created this plugin over here. Um, but yeah, there are a ton. So let's see, Chris is asking, is it worth paying to copyright music before uploading to SoundCloud? No, it is not. So copyright is something intrinsic to the piece that you write. When you write the piece of music, you own the copyright to it. Now, if it's something, I've never actually registered my copyrights, you know, with the U.S. or anything like that. Um, 
if you upload it to SoundCloud and uh, it, it, that's probably gonna be enough to show that you in fact were the first one if you were the first one I mean if it's unique enough um, then then I don't think you have to worry I, for most composers um, don't get your head wrapped around or don't get wrapped around the axle on copyright you know most people aren't gonna come and just steal your stuff people steal famous stuff right and even then it's hard to make the case that you know what's what's completely original what's theirs if you're stealing you know an entire line of lyrics then yeah you're gonna probably have trouble if you're ripping off a melody completely it's not a public domain melody you're probably gonna get yourself in trouble but if you do right that progression is just another variation again on the Romanesca and it was you know Green Day Right, basket case, if you're familiar. Right, so could Green Day sue you for using that progression? No, they, they probably could because you could point to 800 songs written before they wrote it and say, well, why don't those people sue Green Day? I mean, actually, technically, anybody can sue anybody for anything, it seems like. so. But I wouldn't worry too much about the copyright, especially at, at this level. Now, it, it does become a lot more important um, for film scoring, especially if it's a big-budget film, uh, because you've got to clear, um, you got to clear the uh, what's it called o O and R insurance or something like that, where you've got to show like this is an original work and nobody's going to come after us and sue us. Um, and there was a, a pretty famous example recently with uh, it was the the score to 300, um, and it was almost an exact copy of a of one of the cues from Titus. Um, so it was, um, was it Brian Tyler or Tyler Bates? I can't remember who did 300. And then uh, it was Elliot Goldenthal, I think, did Titus. And if you listen to the two, and I'm sure you can Google this or look it up on YouTube, you're like, wow, that actually really is almost exactly the same. And in fact, they had to put stickers on the, the CDs after they released saying, you know, apologies to Elliot Goldenthal, and he got credit for it. And I think he's getting royalties for it. So at that level, when you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars have gone into this, then yes, copyright is, is very important. But, but if you're just writing pieces uh, and you're putting up on SoundCloud, so hoping that you get discovered a little bit, I mean, unless you know that you're like deliberately ripping somebody off, um, I wouldn't worry about people coming and stealing your music because it's just... It's just not worth the effort. I mean, what if some other composer comes along and takes your song and says, it's my song? Now, you haven't made $100 million from this song. It's just a song that you put up there, right? Maybe maybe you've made no money. Maybe you've made a few bucks off of it. Maybe it's on some royalty-free website, or maybe you license it to somebody. Um, are you honestly going to go and sue that person because that's probably going to cost you way more than what you're earning off that piece of music at that point? That's why I say it's just not worth the effort. Um, you know, maybe it's an opportunity for you to talk to this person, collaborate a little bit, and say, "Hey, you know, you like my style? Maybe we should chat a little bit, become friends. I don't know, whatever it is." So, I just I wouldn't worry about paying for copyright. And if somebody's telling you that they want to charge you to to register the copyright for your piece of music, then I would be very suspicious about that. Um, you know, it's not like patenting technology where, you know, somebody's going to make $100 million off of your new way of doing some phone antenna or something like that. Okay, let's see. Martin's asking, uh, I would like to write something for a string quartet. Could you give me some tips? Yeah, so string quartet, what's great about a string quartet, but what also can get you into trouble is that it's very transparent, right? You've got four instruments, and you generally have four parts within those instruments. And sometimes you can do, um, you know, you can do double stops. But especially if you're just starting, I would avoid double stops because they're they can be kind of tricky if you don't understand how the player is going to approach that and if it's going to sound right and if it's worth it. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say. You know, the process of sketching out your musical ideas should really be no different than if you're writing for piano or you're writing for orchestra or writing for a string quartet. 
usually an idea is an idea is an idea. Now, um, it's common to have some very technical, you know, contrapuntal writing with string quartet, but it's not a requirement by any means. So I would stick with writing the kind of music that you're comfortable with, right? Whether that's just simple... Right? You just start with a melody and a harmonic outline and then flesh it out a little bit. So now you've got a melody. Right? Just kind of came up with that. And then write the bass line to it, right? Which will be the cello. kept the C the whole time. It's kind of um, kind of a, a pedal thing. Mm. And then figure out what kind of texture you want from that. So do you want, you know, the the other strings to be doing this? Right? That kind of texture or right? You've got a lot of choices. You can have them do little, you know, tremolos or that kind of stuff. You can you can put the melody in octaves. I mean, you've got a lot of textures you can use, but I think it starts with understanding the core of your musical idea. What is the primary focal point of the music? The melody, the bass line, whatever it is. Now, I like to share and change up who's got the main idea because I like to make it fun for the players as much as I possibly can. So you know, don't always just give the melody to violin one and the bass to the cello. Change it up. Have people play in pairs. So you may have violin one and violin two playing, or you may have, you know, cello and violin two, or viola and violin one. And that gives you a lot of freedom because now you know that it doesn't always have to be full, complete, chordal sounding writing, homophonic writing. You know, it could be this. <laughs> I just added the cello there and then you're doing that and then maybe the violin comes up a little trill up there or something like that start with the focal point of your music so and that's normally why I like to sketch with melody and a, some kind of chordal idea whether I write block chords or I write the chord symbol or I write you know uh, Roman numerals or I write just a bass line with figure bass over it um, however you want to do it. And I skip around to all of those things, even in the same theme. I'll use all of those techniques, just whatever feels like it's going to get the idea down quickly so that I know exactly what I need to be focusing on with the, with the string quartet. The basics, obviously, of writing for strings. I mean, you know, looking at a, a string player is going to be able to play, you know, most simple melodic type ideas that you give them. So if you're giving them... They'll pull that off. You don't have to worry about string crossing. You don't have to worry about bowing. You don't have to worry about all that stuff. Just give them what is the idea that you want. Um, and just remember, too, slurs are bowing, right? So if you've got a slur over 10 notes, it's not that you're trying to tell them play it legato, right? They're going to actually try to bow that in one thing, and you may not. it may not be possible if you've got a really long slur. So I would just... Keep slurs to a minimum when you really want that kind of wah, you know, slurred sound. Other than that, you know, you can write just legato right there. Let them know that it's going to be legato or put staccato notes if you really want staccato. Um, and then let me think. Oh, stick to the ranges, right? It's not, it doesn't have to be that complex. The low C for the cello, um, the low C for the viola, and then the low G for the violins, right? Upper registers, I mean, you can get C7 is generally, I would stop there with the violin, but I would probably, you don't have to go that high unless you're really looking for some special technique, and then you can double check in an orchestration book whether it's going to be playable or not. And also think about who's playing. I mean, if you've got high school kids playing and they're okay at their instruments, they may have trouble pulling stuff off uh, uh, or pulling off difficult ideas up there, whereas, you know, if you're just doing a, a little, you know, ending up there, they could maybe pull it off. 
Whereas if you're with professional players, they'll be able to do a lot more in those kind of ranges. But if you just make sure you don't go beyond the low note, right, and you, you put it in a comfortable range, then they'll be able to play it just fine. Um, the fancier techniques, you know, th things like, uh, and I'll grab the violin. I do have a violin for myself. I do not consider myself a violin player by any means. I use this for checking. Uh, I use this for checking, you know, how is it going to feel for the player. Right, <laughs> like I said, I sound terrible on violin, but, but what I've used this for is like if I have... Right, if I'm using that kind of, I can't remember what that's called, where you're, you know, bowing up and down the strings to create like a chord kind of thing, I can check the chord, I can check the fingering and say, okay, that's going to work, and if they've got a switch, you know, right, if they've got to maybe move up and down arpeggios, which is one, I did that for one of my film scores where they, it was like a C chord, and then they moved up. Right, so I had to make sure I had a chord that was using all four strings that would move up by step comfortably. So it is good to have access to that kind of stuff if you can to double check. It's not absolutely necessary. Um, but just like I tell everybody else, get into the literature. Open up some string quartets from IMSLP that you really like. One of my favorites is the Ravel String Quartet. He uses so many different cool techniques and textures in there. It's just a really amazing piece. Uh, but the quartets by Mozart, obviously the quartets by Haydn, who's really considered the father of the string quartet. He, you know, he really took it from uh, something that was not as high of an art form and really took it to to another level. And Mozart followed suit, and the two of them together really brought the string quartet into its own. And then after that, obviously the the late. And all the Beethoven string quartets are really, really good, but the late ones, especially Opus 132, is just amazing string quartets that he wrote. The Grosse Fugue, just looking at all these different things that he wrote, or that all these, these great composers wrote, you'll start to pick up a ton. And one of the ways I like to actually go about it is if you can read the parts specifically, you'll, you'll get to understand what it is that those players are looking at, right? You'll look at what looks like a good part, what doesn't look like a good part. What ideas stick out to you as, oh, that sounds really cool, and you can circle that or whatever, uh, beyond just looking at the score and to see how things um, you know, interlock. So either, if you can't get the parts, read one part at a time. So listen to the piece four times. Read violin one, read violin two, read viola, read cello, and, and actually get to know what the players are playing. That's, that's just a great way to go about it. Hopefully that puts you in the right direction. Let's see, Patrick's got a question here, and this will probably be the last question um, for the day. Mm. What are your tips for taking a musical idea and growing it? I have a problem of getting a good idea, but I always hit a wall and can't grow it beyond a certain point. Well, you've got to, I think, clear up in your mind what it is you're trying to actually accomplish, because if you've got an idea, right, we'll just we'll take a simple idea. Right, I would call that an idea, right, a basic idea that could be two measures, right? Um, when you say you want to grow it, possibly what you're talking about is you want to finish it out as a complete theme or a further complete piece. So, right, having structure to lean on can really help. there, what I did is I had my basic idea, then I had an exact repetition of that basic idea, which is where you keep the same harmony, but you can change the, you know, kind of the melodic starting point if you want. And then now I get into the continuation where we have a little bit of fragmentation possibly, or we have an increase in harmonic rhythm. Now, 
if I wanted to, I could repeat it, or I could move on. And now I modulate it to three, which is one of the most common modulations in minor. theme here and the contrasting theme is in C major right the it's the, or the, sorry the, a subordinate theme and the subordinate themes in C major and the harmony was similar I kind of had the same thing where I was floating around the the new tonic right whereas the original one was kind of floating around this A minor. This one's floating around here, and I go down to the five, right? Um, and well, here's a great example. I could use what we were talking about at the beginning to bring the whole thing around. So I'm in, I'm now here, C major. Right, I use that progression that Chopin uses in his Nocturne, but I'm not in, I'm not doing it in B flat major, which is the the key that he's using in it at the time, I'm doing it in C major. But it's now, it's a schema in my mind. It's something that I've internalized. Now that may seem a little bit magical, I guess, what I just did, and I didn't explain everything that I did, and a lot of that is covered in the Composition 101 course, but a lot of, a lot of people don't realize that the purpose of learning form, right, the way I see it, is that form gives you a set of tools to continue on with your piece. Now there's a million ways you could cut that, and I was doing it kind of a standard sonata form way which doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to feel stale or feel like you're doing just old hat whatever. Um, but I knew that I wanted it to just kind of feel the same way as I went through. But, but if I use it, you know, some other kind of technique that I knew would make it feel uh, more middle, right? just kind of uh, maybe shifting to a different tonality without a clear uh, modulation. That'll make it feel more like a middle. You know, moving around and... Right, moving around on diminished chords, moving that makes it feel like a middle, whereas sticking to tonic harmony... That makes it feel very much like a beginning, right? That makes it feel like you're not, you haven't, things haven't gone underway. Your journey hasn't really fully begun yet. So, so those are some of the techniques that I, I feel are vital techniques for any composer to understand and know. Um, and as you can see, they're not just these theoretical constructs on paper. They actually allow you to write in the moment and to make quick progress when you're writing. I mean, I was, I probably could continue this thing throughout and you know maybe that that's something I want to work on myself is being able to improvise a piece from start to finish that's three or four minutes long and it sounds like that would be really hard to do but with tools like having these models to build off of with tools that you learn in my composition 101 and 201 courses you know loosening techniques like like um, expansion right if that's your idea you could expand it Expanded 
from the inside, whereas extension, where you add on another formal element to it. different kinds of techniques that really allow you to take that idea, like you said, and grow it into something a little bit more substantial. So, so really it comes down to there's two things going on. You can take a simple idea and you can make it longer with those loosening techniques or a little bit more, uh, you know, interesting with, the, with those loosening techniques. But I think what you're really talking about is developing, taking an idea and developing it into a full piece, right? How to get beyond eight measures. And that's something that really I think you can go about it haphazardly, or you can go about it the way that great composers did it, and they, they learned the basics of theory, they learned how to analyze, they learned how to look at pieces and pull the important information out of it, and then they modeled great composers. You know, There's a reason why almost every great composer from, from you know, Bach to now has written some kind of piece that somewhat resembles sonata form, and that's because you've got it as a measuring stick. You can take something that you write and you say, how does this measure up against this great piece in sonata form? It doesn't mean that that's what you're going to be remembered by, you know? There's a lot of stuff that Beethoven wrote that nobody ever listens to. There's a lot of stuff that Mozart wrote that nobody listens to. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that Mahler wrote that he burned that nobody ever gets to listen to because he knew that, that it was just stuff to learn through, you know? I think Brahms did some of the same stuff, and um, a lot of composers have burned their, their juvenilia pieces, so... So, uh, so yeah, and I'll just say right here, if you're interested in any of the techniques that I've been talking about or teaching here, you have to go to artofcomposing.com and check out Music Composition 101. Um, it is a very thorough course, about 11 hours of video, uh, you know, I think over 30 lessons and um, a lot of examples, a workbook, and I, I walk you through a lot of those compositional exercises where I actually compose and I record it uh, on my computer so you can see how do I approach going through these exercises. So, um, so yeah, and uh, if you signed up, you know, in the past, a long time ago, um, I'm going to be, the, I'm going to be releasing these models exclusively on the, the email list as kind of a step-by-step, -step, like, you know, seven or eight day little series. And, and I plan on doing a couple different composers. Uh, I think I showed you Beethoven's piece a little bit earlier. So, um, I'll, I'll be shooting out some emails when that's ready to go. Uh, and yeah, other than that, have a good weekend. Um, I really hope that this, this goes well. Otherwise I may be having to pay for some more extensive, da extensive damage that I do myself. Um, but I think I can do it. You know, soldering doesn't seem like it's all that crazy. Um, and yeah, other than that, have a good weekend. Enjoy. Go compose some music. Pick a piece. Analyze it. Turn it into a model for yourself. Um, at a minimum, just, just copy it out by hand and, and learn to play through it on the piano a little bit. I think you'll learn a ton. So have a good weekend, everybody, and I will talk to you next Friday, I believe. It's a Friday symposium next week. So it'll be Friday evening, get everybody else on the other side of the planet that's either asleep or awake, night owl, whatever. So I'll talk to you later.